Welcome to the Sunset Safari. As you can see, we've made our way to one of the prominent waterholes in the northern part of Juma Private Game Reserve. That waterhole lies just to the northwest of our boundary called Sydney's Dam. And there's some lions around here somewhere, but unfortunately we can't see them. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Jean Ray on camera with me today. And Jamie and Viam are unfortunately battling a few gremlins, so they're still back at camp. Hopefully they'll be out shortly. And then we have Rebecca and Louise in final control. I'm sitting here in sunny South Africa in a beautiful part of the world called the Lofelt. And we're in the Sabi Sands, a private game reserve, which is part of the massive three, 13 million acre Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. An unfenced wilderness for all the wild beasties. And we're hoping to show you lots of wild beasties on this evening's sunset safari. So should we get going? I think so. So it was quite a busy cat morning this morning. Uh, we were lucky enough to have one of the Birmingham males down on Cheetah Plains and uh, he has left and he's gone to Encoral, the neighboring property. But there's quite a lot of um, wondering about these lions at Sydney's and that's one of the reasons I came up here to have a look. Uh, I haven't, I've heard that uh, Cheetah Plains posted uh, some pictures. I did have a brief look, not a proper look, and I think there's some speculation that it might be junior with Nkoma lionesses. I think probably not. I think from what I can see that male looked a little bit too young to be junior and he should be four and a half-ish now. That male looked to be closer on the two and a half-ish, three side. So it could be Mangen or uh, Mangen Pride, also known as the Tsalala Breakaways, or it could be the Tsalala Pride themselves that also have a few young males. But very exciting, leopard tracks came in across from Torchwood and were lost at Buffles Hook Dam and then they went into the block between Buffles Hook uh, and Hyena Road and I'm hoping it's a big male known as Tingana. He's the dominant male leopard in this area. So fingers crossed that we're gonna have some kitty cats and preferably spot ones. They've been a bit scarce over the last week or so and we have had a few brief visuals or one brief visual of Queen Karula uh, as she crossed out of our Travers area. But I think we're sort of owed a nice good leopard sighting. So hopefully jean and I will be able to bring that to you uh, before the end of the sunset safari. And uh, there we have a beautiful bird of prey that jean is going to show you. That is a batalier. There we go, one of the sharpest eyes in the bush, the batalier. And you can see they do the little wobbly flight. It looks like they're balancing on a tightrope. And that is the French meaning of the name Batelier. That's where they get that. They have that peculiar flight pattern because they're very short tail. So they have to overcompensate. Nice camera work, Chandra. There he is, sawing on the wind. Now, they're often the first bird. Off, they, they off he disappears. Yeah. And they're often the first bird uh, to spot a carcass. Now, in a lot of cases, vultures will fly around much higher than a batelier, and they spot when a batelier goes down to ground. They'll often come down to investigate to see if that batelier's eagle eyes have spotted something they've missed. And sometimes you get some really funny things when a batelier lands to have a sort of a drink of water out of a puddle, and then all of a sudden four big vultures are like, where's it? Where's the meat? And of course, there is none. So, some of our viewers have nicknamed Saturday Cataday, and it does seem to produce. And this morning it produced lions, and I'm hoping this evening it produces leopards. This is a, quite a big 
big thoroughfare for a lot of the animals, including the leopards. It always pays to check at this road junction. Nothing there. So we're quite confident that Mr. Tingane is still inside Juma somewhere. It might not be Tingane, it could always be Gajima. It is right on that sort of area where we see Gajima. For those of you who are not sure who Gajima is, uh, he's another male leopard who's come from the north. He's very unrelaxed around vehicles. We have had some one really wonderful sighting of him, but it took a couple of days when he was on a kill to get him nice and used to uh, us being around. But he's about five or six, Tingan is eight and in his prime. But there is a possibility that this male from the north, or the ghost from the north as I like to call him, uh, is going to start moving further down into Juma. So you will find that where there's a, a leopard boundary that two males are competing for at the same time, you do find those males tend to walk it a lot more. And you, you, can, you can hear them calling at each other. And I know Steph on a bushwalk this morning heard that leopard calling but we were so far away on cheetah plains with the male lion by the time we were able to get back it was too late and i think he had already disappeared into the drainage line a drainage line it's uh, sort of like a dry creek or dry river and the sabi sands is inundated with these little creeks jandre has spotted a lion track i think it's from a day or two ago Go and have a look now. Doesn't look old at all. Oh, I cannot see it yet. Where are we looking? Just next to you. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So it is from a couple of days ago. Sorry, John. Um, and I'm going to show you now why I'm just trying to get it into the light. Go up from there. Just in front of that shadow. And let me just jump out so I can explain it properly. Okay, so jean was quite excited. He thought they were fresh, but they are not. Now, the reason I say this is because we did have some unusual rain. And I can see actually the little raindrops on the track itself. And also if I push this, this lion walked here when it was wet and muddy. So these crests are really hard. So you see that. So if that was a fresh track, that would be really, really soft. And on this hard substrate, the fresh track would be barely visible. It wouldn't have been indented into there like that. So that also tells me it was during that wet period, maybe just after the rain or even because there's no drip, too much drops on top at just at the end of the rain. So, oh, there we go, there's where he is. So, unfortunately, not fresh, but nevertheless a good spot, and it's really helpful to have our cameraman looking for tracks, because uh, they can cover a whole other side of the road we can't, and also, quite often we're just talking too much, to be honest, not looking on the road. It's a skill you develop as a safari guide, being able to not watch the road and yak away and just quick glances over my shoulder every now and then. Hi Edmund! Uh, Edmund was with us on the Sunrise Safari. It looks like he's joined us on the Sunset Safari as well. So good on you Edmund. Lovely to have you out with us. Um, Edmund would like to know, do you have to be African to be a safari guide? And what does it entail? You don't at all. A very good friend of mine is Venezuelan, and she's a safari guide. Um, basically, there are sort of legal requirements if you are guiding guests. And there are different, various different courses that you can do to become a qualified guide. But generally, um, like with most places, work permits can be an issue if you are not from the country you want to work in. So you normally have to prove you have a specialized skill that puts you above and beyond the local guides. Uh, foreign languages is always a good one, but there's a lot of different courses you can do to become a legally qualified field guide. Also, uh, certain lodges will also run their own in-house training course. 
Uh, those are the best ones for me. Uh, probably the best is a, a, a one that happens at Pindat is the best of the training courses. So, if you want to be a safari guide, maybe have a look about that Pindat training course. So a lot of them you pay for, and, and you get your qualifications at the end. The Pinda course you don't pay for, and in, in, in my opinion, it makes it a little better. Uh, what happens is then, if you pass the selection course, as it's called, you then get uh, offered a job, and you pay off that the, the training of you over a two-year period. And you get a very, very good training from that Pinda course. I myself did it a little bit differently, but I, I grew up in the bush and I grew up in safari lodges, so uh, I've been lucky. I've been trained since I was about five years old. So pretty much always going to end up somewhere in the bush, and I'm happy to have ended up here on Safari Live and get to explore the wonders of the Northern Sabi Sands Game Reserves with all of you. start zigzagging shortly and we're zigging and zagging because the last tracks of that male leopard probably a couple of kilometers that way so we're just going to check Gauri cut line make sure he hasn't come further already during the day we get no, some no luck there I heard a big herd of elephants around camp so we can always go have a look for them See, we're heading due east down the long straight boundary road. I love the view from here. Uh, it's sort of a, a road to nowhere, just into the bush. You can see it heading east towards the greater Kruger National Park. This road ends on the boundary. It's amazing how straight it is for a road in Africa. Quite often, when you think you're making a road straight, it turns out that it's not very straight at all. I'm just going to give my monitor a little bit of a dust off there. So I can see what the camera's looking at. tracks were about there hi Chitra who was also watching the sunrise safari Chitra would like to know do we have any luck with those female cheetah tracks after the show this morning unfortunately that lovely lady decided to depart and go on holiday in the Kruger National Park so we are unable to traverse across that boundary so I wasn't unfortunately able to follow up any further but we will be checking in that area in the next in the upcoming weeks uh, to hopefully find that female cheetah just want to check carefully around here Those male leopards quite often use this as a, a crossing point and this is a drainage line I was talking about, or a dry creek. So during the rainy season it flows, but if we have a look upstream here, you can see it doesn't flow very often. And wonderful trees around these little creek beds. And a lot of the trees will only grow in these low areas, like the Timburti, which is just off to the right. And nice big Timburtis at the back as well. Uh, jackal berries or African ebony trees. So, very, very good spot for leopards. Lots of shade, lots of nice trees to climb up into and put their kill if they have one. And also very good for birding. 
And we can hear a babbler babbling. Oh, he's looking at us as well. Oh. So we got an arrow marked babbler. It's the one making all the noise. Obviously quite aptly named. You got him. Okay. To, but there we go. There we go. Babble, 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 babble. So, if you got any of you are new to Safari Live, we really encourage you to keep a bird list. So, if you're just starting your bird list, here's bird number one for the list: the arrow marked babbler. Named so because you can see those little sort of white arrows on his chest. Uh, one of the diagnostics is that bright orange eye. So they're insectivores and they move around in flocks feeding off any insects they can get. There we go. And very aptly named as you can see babbling away. Oh, another one's joined them, maybe they'll babble together. And if you're wondering anything about the babbling babblers, uh, you can ask me a question about them. And you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv. And let's leave the babbles to Babylon. And <laughs> I think that was quite clever, but anyway, uh, we're going to continue on. And uh, we're going to go see if we can find this male leopard. Lovely, lovely winter's afternoon here in the Sabi Sands. You can see very few clouds out in the sky, lovely and blue. And hopefully we can go now find a cat to put in this glorious afternoon sunlight. Probably around 24 degrees Celsius, so low 70s. So, uh, what we call winter is obviously a bit different uh, compared to you guys up there in the northern climes. You guys know what true winter is, and I'm quite happy to stay in the low felt, which is always nice and warm. that male leopard were coming towards this road so we're just going to check down here carefully and quickly before going back to the last track uh, sometimes going back to the last track he might have lain up quite close to the water hole uh, he might have a kill nearby and he's going to and from the water hole to his kill yeah so hey, one second just going to be on the game drive right here i'll tell you all about it in a sec so anyway Gobbles up to Hyena Road. That Kremlin Law was heading along Gallagher Shortcut uh, North. So, looking carefully for his paw prints in the sand. Not only that, as we're checking into the shade, he's unlikely to be lying out in the open sun at the moment. Um, if we're really lucky, he's caught something and popped it in a tree. Uh, you've got to look for leopards, you're looking down, up, and in the middle. of him yet. There's a nice prominent elephant path that I have seen male leopards use frequently in this area. It comes out near that big knob thorn over there. Uh, there's one, two, three prominent paths that I really want to have a check, but this one is always a good one when you're looking for male leopards. They seem 
to like this path. And I've followed them through here many times. And I don't see any tracks just yet. Hi, Jesse. Uh, Jesse is saying since I've guided and, and seen so many different parts of Africa, is there one particular space that stands out for me? Jesse, I really like all the places I've been and, and for different reasons. Uh, and that's the wonderful thing about the bush. It is so diverse depending on where you are. But if I had to, I would say, if I had to do sort of a top, top five, I couldn't even do a top three. Uh, uh, I'm a huge fan of the low fields of South Africa. Uh, love it down here. Actually, I live down here, so it sort of tells you how much I love it down here. So not only when I'm at work, when I live just up the road on another reserve. Um, and then I would probably the, uh, the whole, all the northern Botswana, Kwando, Chobi, Lenyanti, Savuti, that whole area. Uh, the Luangwa Valley in Zambia is another magic place for me. Uh, the Liwa Plains, also in Zambia, in the north, west, uh, eastern, no, western part of Zambia. Incredible place. Uh, oof, the last one's difficult. Uh, southern Tanzania for me is really special. It's really wild. It's very different from anywhere else. Uh, and so I definitely I'd probably say southern Tanzania. Oh, there's a hole in the road. I want to go toppling over through there. But then again, I love parts of Uganda, I love parts of Kenya. So it's a very difficult thing. And one of the nice things about guiding and whatnot is we do get to travel to a lot of incredible places out in the bush. And uh, definitely a couple of, uh, definitely on my bucket list that I haven't even got to yet, Ethiopia. Really want to go do some bird watching in Ethiopia. And then uh, maybe when things calm down a bit, I really really want to go to South Sudan to see the white-eared cob migration and tiang migration and uh, the largest mammal migration on earth and it survived decades of civil war incredible absolutely incredible they migrate from the Sud now the Sud is basically any tracks in that past around there the Sud is I think it's the biggest swamp in Africa and uh, it is on the Nile River so during the dry season they migrate from these massive open plains in South Sudan to the Sud and again a whole host of species that I've never seen there so it makes me quite excited about it. Unfortunately the political climate in South Sudan leaves a lot to be desired. But if someone offered me to go there tomorrow I wouldn't hesitate. I'd just buy a bulletproof vest on my way through. Okay, Mr. Tinganana, where are you hiding? If we don't find any tracks here, it's a strong possibility still between here and Buffalo's Hook Waterhole. So it might be worth going to have a look. Maybe he went backwards for a drink. Unlikely, but we can be optimistic, of course. Hi, Connie, who's in Oregon, land of very big trees in Oregon, uh, very tall trees at least. Well, Connie is asking about a leopard a lot of our new viewers won't know too much about. Uh, his name is Sindile. He's Shadow, who's the dominant female on Arethusa. He's a cub. Last year, he did a very silly thing. He bit a domestic dog that had come into the reserve and that dog tested positive for rabies. I was actually there when it happened. It was quite traumatic. Jandre was also with me when that happened. And um, so once we got the positive test for rabies on the dog, 
Um, that leopard now became a threat. He was just under a year old when this happened. Or just over around there. So uh, he was darted and removed and put into quarantine for nearly seven, eight months. Uh, he was then now recently released back into the Sabi Sands with a after been giving the all clear for, for rabies. Uh, he's got a satellite tracking collar on, but he is a young male leopard, so growing. It's a very specific drop-off collar. Very expensive little piece of equipment. Uh, but it'll drop off before it gets too tight on him. So, there's the backstory to Sindila. And uh, Connie is wondering whether we will put him on camera if we see him. Most definitely, Connie. We will show him to all of you. Uh, so we're not privy to the information about exactly where he is, where his movements are. Only the scientists who are pinging the collar can have that information. And uh, we wouldn't ask them for it anyway. So we cannot tell you exactly where he is because we don't know. But if he happened to appear, and I found some nice fresh pug marks on his old haunts around Gowrie Main, we would definitely show him to you. Look at that, hiding in the grass is a little crested Franklin. Look at that. Look how exquisite those little feathers are. Hiding in the shade. Look at that blink on the eye. And there's another bird for the bird list for anyone who's starting starting a bird list and we're going to leave this little franklin but let's jump across to quarantine which is a clearing outside our camp where jamie is sitting with some elephants a very good afternoon to all of you we have battled off the gremlins or at least eugene has battled off the gremlins and we're starting off in spectacular style. Just have a look at this enormous elephant bull. He just dwarfs the rest of the herd in comparison. Magnificent male. What a way to start off our sunset safari and basically right outside final control actually. He is truly magnificent. There's actually, as you can see, there's a whole breeding herd there as well. And we're feeling a little bit pressurized by him. He is perfectly peaceful and content. Uh, Brent called me over the Game Drive channel while we were busy fixing the, the problems with Wendy. And just let me know that there's one of the balls that is starting to go into must. And that is a little bit cheeky. And you can see there, this is probably the gentleman that he was referring to. If you look very carefully, you can see the liquid that's starting to be secreted between his eye and his ear from his temporal glands. And if I smell the air, it does have that distinctive male in must scent. Uh, whilst we will reposition so that we can see the rest of the herd, we're going to give him plenty of space. What a wonderful way to start off our sunset safari. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Jamie. My apologies for the somewhat delayed start to our afternoon safari. We just had to work on a few technical issues. And this afternoon, Viam is on camera with me. And together, along with Brent and Jandre, we will be traveling around the different reserves and showing you as many extraordinary animals as we can and of course VM and I have a specific desire today to see a leopard. VM of course always wants to see a leopard, not that I don't, but it has been a, a very long time since I last managed to put one on screen. So I think it's time to break that leopard drought and find one. It's not just me, we've all been, we've had a, all had a bit of a leopard drought. 
leopards have been playing hide and go seek. Luckily for us, there are herds like this all over the show at the moment. Now this morning on our sunrise safari, we saw one of the smallest baby elephants I have ever seen. That little elephant must have been probably somewhere in the region of maybe a day old. I think it's the same one I saw yesterday with Viam. Oh yes, there's that smell. Somebody's very definitely in must. I'm not going to push any closer than this. Oh, there's the tuskless, the tuskless bull. He's also a lovely gentleman. He is... Sorry, I'm just having a look at him. Also a big boy, but you don't often see tuskless males. He is particularly distinctive because he's quite a large gentleman. And very, very, from what I've experienced with him, a very even-tempered male. And the elephant herds spending a lot of time being harassed by bulls coming in from the Kruger. You see that very distinctive movement that he just did there, putting the tip of his trunk in his mouth? That was the elephant equivalent of a Fleming grimace. So that movement that animals do to draw the scent that they're smelling into the vomeral nasal organ. They scrunch up their face kind of like they're snarling. Now, elephants can't do that, so what they'll do instead is touch their trunk to a scent and then pop it inside their mouth and touch that organ with the tip of their trunk. We've got such an interesting comparison here. One of the biggest tuskers that I've seen, not quite as big as the one that Brent had yesterday, but perfectly sizable, and then an elephant bull with no tusks whatsoever. And very clearly being intimidated by the presence of the other large bulls. And don't forget that you can send through questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email them through to questions at wildearth.tv. And we do love to hear from you at all moments. It's like having you on the back of the vehicle with us and having a conversation. Roughly 4% of elephants will be without tusks. Here's our boy in must. He's not in full must just yet, or if he, if he has been, then he's coming out of it. He hasn't started dribbling urine at a constant steady rate, as a male elephant in full must will do. He does have that slightly distinctive walk, almost a swagger that male elephants get. And Kathy in Tennessee, you were wondering, do elephant, male elephants hold their trunk in a certain way when they are in must, as a way of indicating that they are? Not really. They might, they might sway their heads a little bit more as part of that swagger. The one thing elephants very commonly do is if they're showing signs of aggression, what they will often do is flop that trunk over the tusk and rub their tusks up and down. That's one of the big indicators, but that doesn't, isn't necessarily an elephant in must. That could be an elephant in any scenario that is feeling uncomfortable or wants to intimidate in some way. Let's reposition before they get too far ahead of us. I think that they are going down to the pan. I know that they are going down to the pan. They're clearly doing their early water run. Unfortunately, since there are still guests in camp, You'll have to watch that sighting from the Juma Dam camera itself. We can't go and interrupt them before they head out on game drive, which they will be doing very shortly because Fan and Will have just driven past in the safari vehicles. So the guests will be out soon. And we'll be able to head past the pan then. Mm trio of really lovely ball bulls. Oh, Paul, you were wondering about, with, when we've got, actually I'm going to stop here for this comparison just because our tuskless Ellie is giving us a couple of over-the-shoulder glances. 
We're wondering about tusks, the presence of tusks being an advantage or a disadvantage for a male elephant. And it will be a disadvantage for him. He won't be able to compete. He'll probably be more intimidated than the big, or by the big bulls with big tusks. However, he's still perfectly comfortable. And of course, elephants are so complex that it's not just a matter of having the biggest tusks. Although that certainly helps. But he seems to know his place and he seems to be staying right behind the other bulls away from the herd. He isn't really pushing his luck. Just all three of them associating with that herd. You might even find that a female is starting to go into estrus and that's why they're following so closely. Not of course impossible that they are just associating with that herd for a little bit of company, but that might be one of the reasons. All right, well our Illies have moved on and so shall we because we can't follow them down to the pan at the moment. We'll start heading out and see what else we can see and hopefully Wendy's problems should now be sorted out. We'll keep our fingers crossed and we'll tap on wood or knock on wood or whatever else we need to do for good luck to keep the gremlins at bay. But so far so good. I am, of course, only on quarantine at the moment. <clears throat> Aha! Ellie's not going down to the pan. Ellie's walking right past the house where... Oh, whoopsie. Brent, Jerry, Eugene and myself all live. And off he goes with that parting shot. Oh, as we leave these ellies and go off in search of other things, I'm sort of really hoping we might see that elephant calf once again. Mike, you were wondering if an elephant raises its head, is that a sign that it is unhappy with you? No, not necessarily. The elephants have a complex combination of different body language cues. It's the same way they talk to each other and it's up to us as safari guides and as people to learn to read and interpret what they're saying to us. It's, it's learning a language basically. So an elephant might lift its head and try and make itself look big. Ears out is, a very, is one very clear indication that the elephant is a little bit unhappy. Ears out to try and make themselves look bigger, maybe swinging their trunk ever so slightly. Let's just stop here because these tracks are so fresh. They are glinting in the afternoon sun. It gives you an opportunity to see just how big those Ellie Ball's feet are. And what a fresh, fresh track of an elephant looks like. Mike, I will get back to answering your question more fully in a moment. I just had to take this opportunity and I'm actually going to hop out of the car to show you more clearly. Look at how crisp and clear those lines in the tracks are. Oopsie, I'm about to caught, uh, very much caught in my cable, sorry about that. So when you're looking at a track, the outline of an elephant's feet or any kind of track, the crispness and the ease that you can see them is what tells you exactly how fresh these tracks are. So yes, we saw those elephants walk past, so we know exactly when those tracks were made. But it gives you a nice size comparison. <laughs> They're rumbling away at me. So this is, it's difficult for you guys to see, and let me put my shadow out of the way. But this is his front foot here. Isn't that incredible? far larger than a dinner plate. His back foot is slightly more oblong and forms a little bit of an arrow pointing in the direction of where these elephants were going. So if we hadn't seen them walk past, we would know that they've headed across in that direction. And just to give you a sense of scale, I'm not sure if this was the big boy or not. I suspect, however, that it might be. 
Just to give you a sense of scale, here's my hand for comparison. Just have a look at that. I mean, I could fit myself in there if I wanted to. Exceptionally large tracks, and it's one of the things that makes an elephant so silent because their tracks, or well, their feet spread out as they walk and kind of absorb the weight on that spongy cushion that is part of an elephant's foot structure. Now, a nice little opportunity just to have a look at those tracks. And a very pleasant way to start off the afternoon. Most of you will know that I always enjoy spending time with elephants. Okay, well now we've got to go and look for that leopard for Viam. While we do, Mike, I was in the process of answering your question about elephants' body language. And as I said, they've got quite a complex and quite a vast array of different cues and signals that they send us as people. Now, a, a lifted head could just mean curiosity. It might just mean the elephant wants to have a closer look at you. Same thing with the, with the raised trunk. Being this, sniffing a little bit, that just indicates that the elephant wants to know a bit more about what you are and what you're up to. It isn't necessarily aggression. The same goes, of course, for a lot of tourists when they come to the Kruger National Park and they think that the elephant's trying to scare them by flapping its ears. But of course, all the elephant is doing is just cooling itself down using those built-in air conditioners with their complex system of capillaries and veins. So looking for an upset Ellie, the signs of an upset Ellie, stiff tail and raised head, is lots of different ways to interpret elephant behavior. Now uh, from one very big animal to one very big antelope, Brent has found you a very fluffy water buck. So we're at the Buffles Hook water hole and there's a pair of water buck having a drink. Isn't that just lovely there? Oh, it's such cuddly, I think is the best way to describe water buck. Yes, you cuddly and that wonderful fluffy neck now they are a very big antelope one of the biggest we get out here and look at those wonderful little white circles on their bottoms tails are wagging to keep the flies at bay sort of suddenly realized we've been watching them this whole time sitting up on the high ground above the water hole Very windy at the moment. So they're going to be quite cautious while drinking and looking around, making sure nothing is going to ambush them. And just to the left of them, on the move at the moment, is a grey heron. Wonderful bird. Out after fish and frogs, well, not too many fish after the dam dried earlier this year, but definitely some frogs and aquatic insects, hopefully for it. Not that it's adverse to eating non-aquatic insects and creatures. Yeah, there's water buck. Now, a water buck is one of the few, well not the few animals, but uh, all animals will, if they feel enough pressure, run into the water for safety. But water buck tend to do it a bit more often. What is that water buck scene? So you see it's looking back. It's a little bit nervous. I can't see anything just yet. Wouldn't it be magnificent if the male leopard just decided to stroll out? Definitely looking at something there. Now, uh, as we d get deeper and deeper into the dry season, little water holes like this are going to become incredibly important. important. You can already see the mass of animals that have utilized it. So they've dung everywhere and they've come down here to drink and there's, there's literally elephant dung, buffalo dung and tracks everywhere. There's just this myriad of tracks around this water hole. And I was hoping for a bit more 
But as you can see, I'm gonna get John ready to show you now. I mean, literally there's not an inch of sand that doesn't have a footprint on it. Oh, and if we come off to the right, I've just noticed another pretty little bird on the edge of the water. Um, a little bit more to the right. Come, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep coming. Keep coming. Oh, okay, yeah, we've gone a little bit to the left. We can zoom almost center screen now. Right on the edge of the water, a little bit to the right. No, 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 not the heron. <laughs> okay, right down on the edge next to us. Not this guy. No, not the ox peckers. Um, on the water right next to us. There we go. Very dainty little bird called the three banded plover. Look at that. Out sifting for little aquatic insects on the edge. So, almost exclusively found near bodies of water, a little plover. Oh, itchy. Very, very beautiful. I think that water back. Oh, there's a terrapin popped his head up. So, oh, and popped it down again. Terrapins are like a turtle. Heron's now gone right into the water, trying to find something. And see, utilizing its long legs. Now, if any of you live in Europe, the grey heron also occurs there. And if I remember correctly, I think it also occurs in North America. So, one of the most widespread bird species in the world. But enough dilly-dallying at the dam, we got big cats to find. So I took a little walk into the bush and I found those male leopard tracks. Now I think unfortunately that that male leopard is still in this area here. So there's a big elephant path over there that, there we go, it goes off into the bush there. And I walked down it, we followed his tracks and he goes into a very thick area where there's a myriad of those little dry creeks I was talking about, very steep ones. So even if we did find them, we're unable to get a vehicle in there. But I definitely think it's going to be worth our while coming back a little bit later when that leopard's likely to get moving sort of around 5.30ish and check on the other side of this block. But till then, let's go see what else is out here on Juma Private Game Reserve. Have our water back, herons and plovers. Hello, Debbie in Vancouver. Debbie's wondering why our leopards are being so scarce. And are they staying deeper in the blocks because of the drought and less cover? No, not at all, Debbie. I think they're just, we're just missing them. Our timing is off at the moment. And they actually love drought because it makes it a lot easier for them to catch animals because the animals are forced onto water points. Uh, and also they're not in the best condition. So it does make it a bit easier for them to catch prey. So it's not that, I just think we, we're a bit unlucky at the moment, to be honest. We've got lots of lion luck at the moment, but not very much leopard luck. about if we don't have lots of leopard luck there are lots of other little creatures to look for and that one has done a disappearing act unfortunately with a little robin a little bird flew into that thicket there but I can't spot it now 
and we have been doing so well with the birds so far. I think we've got four or five species. Um, I think my personal best in a game drive, put them on camera, is when James and I had a competition. I think we got 26 or 27 species in one drive. Now, it's going to be challenging in this weather with the wind, but I think we can give it a go. Uh, we've started off well, slow but steady. So, let's see if we can beat the personal best of birds on the live drive. I'm just going to get on the game drive radio for those not sure. We are in contact with all the other vehicles out there and it helps us to find more animals. So I just want to get an update uh, if Taxon had anything further on this male leopard. Taxon is the safari guide who drives out of the Juma Lodge. Taxi, taxi. Of moving forward, did you have any luck with uh, that one on Ingwe? This morning. Copy, thanks, taxi. I found a new Avichan into that block there. I saw his in Kwanzo. I went into one of the Shkovas and then I lost it. But I made it a little bit slightly south. West was the last track I found. Sorry about this, guys. I'll be with you in a second. Oh, more wolf back. Copy, thanks, Paul. So, Taxon's also desperate for leopard at the moment, so we've all been searching low and high. Yeah, more female water back. They look like they're on their way down towards the dam. Bye bye, ladies. So, let us see what's happening. And it sounds like Jamie's on the birding competition as well. Is that a challenge I do detect? I think we have an unfair advantage with our camera, but let's go see what birds Jamie's got. Now you see, I knew that this was going to get made into a competition. I was actually going to help Brent and all of you add to your bird lists, starting off with some red-faced mouse birds. The reason I say I'm not going to try and enter into a competition in this is because well, we just we don't have the camera to do it, as Brent actually commented on, in all fairness. So I was intending to add to the bird list, not necessarily compete in the bad list, in the bird list, not the bad list, the bird list. <laughs> I figured we could work together this afternoon. Let's not do a competition, although it is of course a competition to find that leopard. That's a different story. That is a genuine competition. But the bird list I feel as though this afternoon we should all work together, or at least the four of us should work together. Now we've added a fifth one to Brent's bird list. A red-faced mouse bird is what you were looking at there. It's been a long time since I've driven along Ingwe Alley. Oh, Ingwe Alley got its name from its propensity for leopard sightings. Oh, I just thought it might be a nice idea to come traveling along here. You never know. Tingana could well pop out. This is one of his favourite spots. It's also one of Karula's favourite spots. She really enjoys the riverbed system that runs parallel to this road. And in fact, this is where I very had my very first proper sighting with Karula. It was the second time I'd ever seen her, but it was the first time I enjoyed spending a little bit of time with her, where she... Oh, got some nice courting happening here with these kudu.
seeing a lot of it with the Kuru at the moment. There's quite a few females in estrus with the male following along very close behind her. This could well be the same courting pair that we watched a couple of days ago at Guayatena Dam. Let's try to get another view. Unfortunately, that female seems quite intent upon moving away. Away from the attentions of the male. Hey, everybody, duck. Watch your heads. <laughs> We're just going to skim that. Here we go. Made it. And heads again. How's it going, boy? Are you, are you managing there or are you not having any luck? Oh, he's going to move right off. Distracted by the prospect of a late afternoon snack. Courting is a... Oh, he's not, he's not snacking, sorry. He's horn rubbing, marking, first of all marking the bush and then also beating it up to show just how manly he is. And possibly scratching an itch on his forehead. One of the other reasons that the big antelope do that. I don't think so though. I think he's trying to impress his lady friend with just how big and scary he is. He is truly magnificent. Beautiful kudu ball. But, as with most kudus, relatively shy and much more at ease when in thick vegetation. He has moved off for the moment. Oh, goodness. He was a f little baby absolutely frozen. Cute little one. Hello. Little baby kudu. Where's your mommy? Is that big kudu scaring you? Let's go get another view. He is so sweet. I think if I move any more, he's going to startle even further. That is one tiny little baby kudu. Very sweet. I mean, it's interesting that that male's courting the mother of this calf, if indeed it is the mother. There could be other kudu elsewhere. It would be a little bit too soon for her to be going into estrus. Interesting. His first instinct was to dash up onto the termite mound. That's quite fascinating because you'd think that it would try and hide and be a little bit lower. I'm going to go forward a bit. Got a nice clear view. We often see kudu playing about on termite mounds, but it's interesting that it sought refuge at the top there. Maybe a natural instinct that higher ground is slightly safer than lower ground. Where's your mom, little one? If I stay really, really still, then she can't see me, I think is the approach here. <laughs> Alright, I don't want to actually keep this, fem this little kudu calf from following behind its mom. It's, it's frozen in fear at the moment. It doesn't want to move while we're here and looking at it. So we're actually going to move on so that we don't run the risk of separating it in any way from its parents. I can't see any other kudu. Have you seen one, Viam? Oh, there's, the ma there's another male. Maybe following behind. He's obviously not been the victor in this competition for the female. Oh, and he's going to walk, hopefully, going to walk right out in front of us. He is also magnificent. Big shaggy neck. Two and a half twirls of those horns spiraling up above his head and very powerful shoulders. And he's got a fresh injury on his right front leg. So they've been fighting. I can almost guarantee that those two males, the first one that we saw and now this boy here, I can almost guarantee 
that they've been, come into conflict at some point over that female. And as I said, I don't want to hang around and separate this little baby who's still watching, keeping an eye on what the male's doing. Hey, little one, go find your mommy. Yes, go find your mom. Okay, let's leave it be. It's okay. There's Franklin alarm. I think I just heard Franklin alarm calling. Sorry, I just had to switch off the vehicle so I could listen. I do hear Franklin alarm calling. In this thick drainage line. Let's go. I think let us go around and to the other side and just check up. Could well be a bird of prey that startled them, but it could also be of course, there's always the possibility of a leopard hanging around. That frantic screech, though, that I heard, is, I, I find impossible to imitate. It's a sort of a chuk -a -chuk -a -chuk -a -chuk -a -chuk sound. And then what they do, that's, the, that's their alarm call when they've got a serious fright, when they've been hunted by something like a, a goshawk, for example. And then what they do for ages afterwards is they make these little sort of stuttering cries of alarm, like they're terribly, terribly upset. And actually, I can't go down there because I won't have signal in that little dip. Hello, guys. Long time no see. Another tuskless elephant. That's not the bull that we were looking at earlier, I don't think. Interesting. This is now the second one we've seen. I think this is the herd with two tuskless females, one younger and one older. Lynette, you were wondering, do I think that they realize that they are missing tusks? Yes, I think that they do. I think that they are aware of that. Um, I don't know that they necessarily are aware of the disadvantage that it's, it puts them at. Obviously, a tuskless elephant is not is never born with tusks, so they never have tusks in their lives. So it's not like they had something and then lost it. But they can't use them for digging, they can't use them to scrape up the bark, obviously, to strip bark away from the trees. So they've just got to have a very different approach to feeding. We should be able to keep watching them from this side. Here you go. This is for Emma and Victoria, who are five years old. Welcome to our safari. I hope you're enjoying yourselves. Apparently, you really wanted to see elephants, but now you would also like to see a leopard. Me too, Emma and Victoria. Me too. I promise you that between Brent and myself, we are going to do our utmost to try and find out where that leopard has gone. Apparently, Brent's already on foot. So he's had a head start, he's gone wandering off. <laughs> yeah. Ah, and apparently he has just popped back into his vehicle. So let's see if he has an update on that leopard for you. So look at that. Sabi Sands, low felt bush. We just stopped here for a little bit. We're listening, see if we can hear any signs of animals around. Unfortunately, it's very quiet in this area, but we do have a few birds around us, which is always nice. And uh, there we go, we've got red bull buffalo weaver in the road. Oh, and as well as, uh, looks like, there we go, a virtual starling, red bull buffalo weaver in the foreground. And then, slowly moving through and feeding. Let's see, there's a few more species with them. Get a little bit closer. You can see them all flying around. There we go. That yellow-billed hornbill. 
So it's, it's not uncommon to find these mixed groups of birds feeding together. And they all feed on slightly different things. Oh, off the hornbill goes. He's not feeling very photogenic. Although, incredibly beautiful bird. I still love those little patterns on his wing. So, no luck with those male leopard tracks. So, when you can't find a male leopard, what do you do, Jean-Ray? Find a female leopard. There we go. So, we're going to go look in that area where there was a report of Queen Kruler crossing yesterday. But come heaven or high water, we can't seem to find any sign of her. But maybe this afternoon's going to change our luck. to a Zimbo in London. There's quite a few Zimbabweans living in London these days and uh, a big welcome and I hope we're helping alleviate your homesickness while you're over there on Mada Island. And uh, Zimbo in London would like to know, do we get a Karachani thrush uh, out here? Oh, hello little Inyalas. See a little bit nervous in this wind. Look, there we are, a little Inyala. I've just heard an interesting update on the Game Drive channel in front of us. Okay, let's try and get a little bit closer. So, um, I've just heard something on the radio. I'm just going to answer quickly. Yeah, I'm on Mamba Mawati. I'm also interested to help follow up in that area. Look at that. Look at that beautiful, beautiful little antelope. And Kathy in Tennessee, don't worry, Zimbo in London, I haven't forgotten you either, is wondering, she keeps getting confused between Inyala and Kudu. Unfortunately, I'm going to disappear into the thickets now. But the easiest way is Inyala are much, much smaller, Kathy. Uh, and also, they are orange. So the females are orange, and the males are dark chocolate brown, where the, both male and female Kudu are the same color. And the males are double the size of the females. So he's always just calling me, standing by. Um, Moati Mamba. Ah, uh, copy, thanks. Okay, so there's some monkeys alarm calling back towards camp. That means there could be a leopard there. It sounds like right next to our camp. But anyway, while we make our way there, uh, the Zimbo in London is worrying about a Karachani thrush. And do we get them here? We do, but they're not that common. Actually, the only place I tend to see them is inside the Juma Lodge. But we do get them here. And uh, we will definitely try and get one on camera for you. They are a beautiful bird. And we only really get two thrush species here, the Karachani thrush and the groundscape at Thrush. And I will try to show you what the Karachani Thrush Zimbo in London is talking about looks like. Okay, let's have a quick, let's just get through this section and then 
I'll show you what the thrush looks like. Yeah, there we go. And let's just get up and out of the bumps. So there is the Karachani thrush that the Zimbo in London is looking forward to seeing and sure it reminds you of home. And there we go, that's their distribution and we are right in that dark green section, so right in the core part of their range. Okay, well, we're going to keep moving towards where there's possibly a leopard that's being shouted at by monkeys. Kim Kim is wondering, what is the story behind Juma Game Reserve? So it's actually quite an interesting story, Kim Kim. So this whole area, the Sabi Sands Game Reserve, is made up of a bunch of different farms. And originally, uh, they, were, they attempted to farm cattle in this area. And uh, it was very unsuccessful because the lions kept eating all the cows. So then, for many years, up until the early 60s, basically, or well, most of this land was owned by a company called Consolidated Sugar. So, and then they tried to do cattle farming and then they sold off pieces of it, uh, mostly to their directors of the company bought this land as a private hunting reserve. So there were never really fences between the individual properties. And until the late or early 60s, uh, with the, the first sort of safari lodges opened up and the first ever safari lodge in South Africa, private safari lodge, was in the Sabi Sands Game Reserve and it's called Mala Mala, which is to the south of us. And then, Londolozi started next door and Sabi Sabi and there's a buffalo there but we need to keep going sorry guys to get there we've got a possibility of a leopard and so hunting continued actually probably into the early 90s and in different properties and different rules but the sort of south and central uh, became premier game viewing destination one of the premier game viewing destinations in the world now, Juma itself uh, was bought by the Mulman family in the 70s. But before they owned Juma, they used to own Cheetah Plains. And eventually they sold Cheetah Plains and, and bought Gauri, which is where Juma is. And so it's been in the Mulman family for probably close on 40, 50 years now. And they have a great love for the African bush. And uh, it was around there. 2000 that they decided to open up this property uh, to guests from all over the world and before that it was just for the use of the family and that's how Juma Private Game Reserve was born. And there are two lodges on it, uh, Gallego and Voyatella and uh, each can sleep 10 guests. So we're getting quite close to camp again. I'm just going to get on the radio, Aubrey, uh, asking where you'd like me to check. Aubrey, Aubrey. And Aubrey is the ranger for Gallagher Camp. Aubrey, I'm approaching Voyatella Dam. Uh, where do you want me to check? Would you like me to check from Vubu to the shortcut or round towards Gallagher shortcut? When you're in a rush, things appear. So we've got zebra and we've also got a traffic jam up ahead. And it's a breeding herd of elephants. Hi guys. 
there's a big pool at the back. And yes, a little bit unfortunate. We're not going to be rushing through the middle of this lot. We're going to have to wait for them to move off or go round. It looks like they're going to move off the road. But quickly across to Jamie, who's got a nocturnal bird species. Well, here we go. I know it's not an exact competition, exactly. I've already said it's not a competition, but if it were a competition, I'm pretty sure that these birds that I've just spotted should count for several points. Because if we have a nice close look, look very, very carefully. Unfortunately, we need Brent here with the super zoom camera. We have two little barred owls roosting tightly squished together, one of the smallest of our owl species. Isn't that lovely? Picture of serenity. They keep every now and again glancing back towards us. They're so far away, at first I wasn't entirely sure if we were looking at pearl spotted or barred owlets. But from what I can see through my binoculars, they lack the eyes on the back of the head that is typical of a pearl spotted owlet. And I'm relatively certain that what we're looking at is a pair of barred owlets and then of course the Inyala walking underneath them. Now I just I absolutely love seeing the little owls. It's a pity that we can't get close up however you'll have to take my word for it that their facial expression is always incredibly disapproving like you've done something wrong. You've done something to grievously offend them somehow. A very serious look to them. The pearl spotted scops owl and the African barred owlet all have that identical disapproving expression. Y'all are crossing. What a lovely herd of Inyala wandering across the road. Oh, look at all the dots on that one at the back. And here, oh, they've just disturbed some pigeons in there. So in terms of our birding, I think we've done relatively well with those tiny little owls that are very far away. I just noticed them in terms of just being like a slight, something slightly off about the tree branch. Now, Bob G, just on the subject of birds, you were wondering if we get white-headed buffalo weavers um, in this area. And the answer is no, we don't. The only buffalo weaver we see here is the red-billed buffalo weaver. We'll have to go searching a little bit further afield to find the white-headed buffalo weaver. Cute. All right, let's leave our peaceful owls, because they're not going to be up to much. And during the winter time, you'll actually hear the pearl-spotted and the barred owlet calling throughout the day particularly on cool cloudy days. Now typically in summer they are crepuscular birds. In other words, they, call, they are active in the early evenings and then in the early mornings as a way of largely to avoid competition with the larger owl species, which can and do hunt them if they have the opportunity to do so. Now that's the reason why the little owls are crepuscular. It also means that in winter, you see them far more frequently, or at least you hear them far more frequently than you would during the middle of the day in summer. And for those of you who are, keep an eye on the Juma and the Arethusa Dam camera, you may even have heard them every now and again, particularly the highly vocal pearl-spotted owlet that... <coughs> ...series of descending whistles not my best impression of a pearl spotted owlet ever, but my lips are terribly dry in this winter, winter temperature. But you may well hear them more and more 
on the Juma Dam camera and on the Arethusa Dam camera. Oh. Brent's checking all the way up to the north. They think that Tingana's been moving west. I'm just making sure that he hasn't decided to come south. He loves Vulture's Nest and he loves Nyala Road south. So we're going to check there, check around here and check the block in between. Make sure that he hasn't pulled a sneaky maneuver and crossed somewhere here. The chances are that somebody would have picked up on his tracks crossing one of the main roads that runs through the center of Juma. Funnily enough, nicknamed or named Central Road. But it's, very, it's a very sandy, very easy road to track on. And we get used to the different roads and the difficult, different difficulty levels in terms of tracking. Now this was the big boar bean that Tingana was hiding his kill under a couple of months ago with Brent, where Brent went wandering off the vehicle and actually saw Tingana catch that Impala on foot, then had to do a mad sprint back to the vehicle. That's exactly where that sighting was. Very easily recognizable with the Scotia Bracca Petali, the boer bean, the weeping boer bean tree. The bark used to treat ailments such as hangovers, if you could term a hangover an ailment, but also a general pain killer general pain killing ability. Well, we're on a roll with some of the more unusual bird species. Brent's got a scimitar ball. So we are now in that area where the monkeys were alarm calling. And I heard some little bird alarm calls. I'm just double checking around this area. Just idle through here. So the monkeys were alarm calling around here. Bird's alarm call that helps us find a leopard. Come on, Lord, where's the leopard? Go have a look at the next water. Okay, so I'm really hoping it's just here at some sort of inclination that that cat, there's a cat around here, but unfortunately not to be just yet. But maybe they've left a footprint for us to follow. Gallagher camp just up ahead there. Yeah. This is a favorite area for both female and male leopards. Just want to be doubly careful we don't miss anything. So far the only fresh tracks I can see here are elephant. Monkeys seldom get it wrong, but if I was a leopard, I would definitely think twice about drinking at this pan. 
it's got some bounces at the at the bar. There we go, some buffalo balls. The Gallagher pan bounces. Uh, retire the gentleman's club. Again, while we look at the buffalo, I'm just using my ears. Just really hoping to hear an alarm call, but no such luck so far. So, these buffalo bulls like to spend their time around water holes. They don't tend to travel too far from the water hole. They might move up the hill a little bit to where it's a bit warmer when it gets dark for a snooze. And the reason these retired gentlemen spend their time together is there's a couple of reasons. The main reason is that there's, if there's more of you, you're less likely to be the one who gets eaten by the lions. See, I'm not doing much but ruminating, chewing the cud. But no sign of anything else at the pan. And let's carry on. So we're in search of a possible predator here. The monkeys were alarm calling in this area. They generally only alarm call a lion, leopard, and cheetah. So hopefully we'll find something. I'm just listening to Aubrey giving me the update about those monkeys. So they apparently were calling incredibly aggressively and incessantly. So it's possible that whatever they were calling at has laid down in one of those little creek beds. So I might take a little stroll through there, but you've got to be careful of those old buffalo bulls. They can be a problem from time to time. Debbie wants to know which is the most reliable creature when it comes to alarm calling and a big cat and which is the worst. I would say the most reliable is monkeys, baboons and kudu. Those are the three reliable ones. Uh, the least reliable are Impala and Inyala. Actually Bushbuck are also quite, an, uh, quite reliable. But in Parla and in Yala, not so much. But I think probably the most frustrating for us is the squirrels and the Franklin, because they alarm, being so small, at everything. So they alarm at birds of prey, they alarm at mongoose, they alarm at snakes. Uh, so they're probably the most frustrating. So we follow up maybe hundreds of those for alarm calls, but with nothing on the end. Maybe the fleeting glimpse of a slender mongoose disappearing. But I think I'm going to go take a stroll into this little thicket here and hopefully I can find the cat. But while I do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to. While Brent goes for a wander off into the thicket and sees what he can find there, you find me somewhat bemused by the presence of lion tracks on Nyala Road South. Now, I would love to know exactly when these came from this morning, we were convinced that there was a mystery male lion somewhere in the vicinity. That was not the one that was around Sydney's dam. Because we heard him calling, Steph heard him calling. Now that's really hard for you to see. 
very, very difficult. So what I'll do is I'll jump out and I'll just trace the outline for you, make it a little bit clearer as to, I think Brent actually did show you some line tracks. I'm not going to spend too long talking about them. Brent, I think, started his afternoon looking at line tracks. But I'm quite bemused by their presence. I wonder where this gentleman came from. I also want to have a look. It gives me an opportunity to get down a little bit closer to see how fresh they are. Uh, it's very difficult for you guys to see, but a starling has walked right across this track. So they are, that doesn't really tell us all that much. It's late afternoon, that could have happened any time. But the outline of the track is here. This is the back pad. I should have done that with a stick and not my big clumsy finger. And then the toes here. So this kind of sand, this very gritty sand, makes it more difficult to tell exactly how old the track is. And we've spoken before about stepping next to it to try and get an idea of what a fresh track looks like in a certain substrate. You can see my shoe print not all that distinct. So, where on earth did this male lion come from and where has he gone and is he still here? I think we shall have to follow up on that and see if we can't figure it out. I'm sure this is the gentleman that was... I call them gentlemen. I mean, male lions, I think that's a little bit of a stretch. But I think this is the male lion that we heard roaring. It wasn't really roaring so much as that lazy contact call that the Birmingham boy was doing this morning with Brent on Cheetah Plains. That sort of half-hearted... Hmm deal. It doesn't look as though he's expended all that much energy. The tracks are very clearly going that way. There's a reason why I'm going around, I'm going to loop back around to where they would pop out just to check and see whether, first of all, where he came from, but just to make sure that a Tingana hasn't come wandering through here. I know Brent is checking around Galago Pan but we need to make sure that we cover as much ground as possible. Plus, I don't think there's any rush to try and follow those tracks. I, I think that they're actually quite old. I think that they might be either from last night or from very early this morning. And wherever this lion's come from, he hasn't walked all the way along this road because the tracks have already disappeared off it. So he's come through the drainage line through one of these river systems. Uh, stations, did anybody drive in Yala Road South this morning or this afternoon? There's Nkonzo for Medora and Gala, just one going north along Yala Road South. They look like they were maybe from this morning. Um, not myself, but uh, I know the guys were trekking on uh, Rura Ingo this morning from the Wissup Dam and they, uh, yeah, somewhere close to Nyala Central Road. So I think I'm not on the Central in the drove of that area. Copy that, thank you, Andrew. Sorry, guys. Let's see if there's any little uh, baby Preston Franklins. Okay, copy that. Thank you. Might be fresher than I thought. That's interesting. Good luck. Beautiful Preston Franklins to add to our list of birds. And for those of you who have been keeping close track of our bird life, there have actually been several births or several hatchings of the different Franklin and Spurfowl species. Here you can see, you can even see the spur on the back of its legs that they use for, males in particular, will use for fighting each other. No babies with this group, however, and I've just heard that somebody did drive that road 
earlier this afternoon, which means that those lion tracks are actually much fresher than we thought they were, and he could be on his way to Buffalo's Hook Dam for a drink. So we're going to change. I'm going to change my route, and we're going to go back and we're going to follow them. And that's what I was chatting about in the Game Drive channel. Basically, I wanted to double check with all of the other vehicles out if they had driven along this road, because I could see fresh-ish looking car tracks and when they had driven along the road. Because that in turn would tell us how old those tracks really were. And we're going to go back on ourselves, let's race to the position of those last tracks. I'm going to be horribly embarrassed if we drove past a lion, but I don't think we did because both Liam and myself have been checking so carefully for any sign of Tingana. I think we probably would have spotted him. But he could well, on a cool afternoon like this afternoon, it's not too hot, it's not freezing, but it's not too warm, so a male lion could quite happily be moving through an area. Of course, it's just a question of timing, because Brent has already checked Buffalo's Hook Dam, but it's always worth checking once again, because the animals, especially at this time of day, are now moving out and about quite, quite actively. Where did I pull off? I pulled off here. These tracks go along straight through there. Now there are reports that the mystery male lion at Sydney's dam is the Nkuhuma male known as Junior. I've got conflicting reports and of course we haven't been able to go and see them because we've also got a, heard a report. Some people have said that it is the Nkuhumas and Junior and others have actually said that it's some of the Mangani pride. So a split away from the rest of the group. And without being able to go closer, I can't tell you, Taxon certainly didn't know who they were and he didn't think that it was Nkuhumas plus Junior. But again, we just, we're not 100% sure without going, being able to closely examine. But we will get hold of some photographs and we will double check and confirm. If it is Junior, and it's by no means impossible, he has come through and visited once before and he was last seen up but in our vicinity, he was last seen up towards the Simbabili area and Sydney's Dam, which is up in our northwestern corner. Then he moved to cross to he moved south to Mala Mala, and then he went north again. So it is it's a hundred percent possible. We just don't. We've got conflicting reports at the moment as to who it is. Uh, we do have a question asking if it is Junior. Is there a chance that he would kill the new Nkuhuma cubs? Yes, there is a chance that he would do that. It's, it's an interesting situation. And that came from Debbie in California. It's an interesting one. I'm not 100% sure what would happen. And in fact, I don't think anybody could be 100% sure. And typically, it would be a, a male lion disperses at, that, at Junior's age in order to avoid him breeding with his mother or his sisters or any member of his family when he does, does reach sexual maturity. The way in which he handles that is, a, is another story. We've got an African hawk eagle there. I couldn't quite, I couldn't quite see. Oh, I've been doing some awesome camera work. I'm trying to get my binos out and on in time. Hmm, mystery raptor of some kind. Wasn't an African hawk eagle, my apologies. There wasn't enough white on the underside of its wings, but it just, just turned its body ever so slightly before I could double check what was under, what kind of coloration were underneath the wings. Bit too big to be anything else other than an eagle of some description. Right, the lion's gone off the road and he's carried on to the north. 
Unless that was just a patch of tracks that didn't get driven over, but I don't think so. Now we have to think carefully about which way we go, because I don't think we're going to be able to follow them and have signal at the same time. Oh, we were talking about Junior, sorry, to finish that, that conversation off. His instinct would generally be to kill any cubs that he does come across that are not his. But would that be the case with his own family members? I'm not 100% sure exactly how that situation would play out. But there is a possibility that he would harm the Inkuhuma's cubs if he found them. Luckily, they are on opposite sides of the reserve for now. So we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed that our Inkuhuma girl knows what she is doing. All right, well, let's see how Brent's wanderings have gone. Gives me a chance to check for this lion. And we'll catch up with you, hopefully, with a cat on your screen. So I had a walk into that little river system. Unfortunately, all I found was some antelope. So maybe those monkeys saw something a bit further away. So we're widening our search arc a little bit. could very easily be that male leopard we were looking for earlier. His general direction has been towards the camp also. He is, it's been very cool today, so it's very possible he might have moved quite a lot during the day. So you never know where he might pop up. So no sign here. There's another road that links back down towards that little system of rivers. So trying to drive off-road here is a real nightmare. There's about nine different little river systems and a lot of them are quite steep. So you're completely unable to get a vehicle through them. Come on, leopards, where are you hiding? So, I'm feeling lucky with this different route we're going to take. I've got a feeling. And uh, Tingana is the dominant male in, in this area, and John Boy is wondering, will he tolerate Sindile. Probably not, uh, John Boy. Sindile is nearly two years old now, uh, so it hasn't been around either, so I don't think he'll tolerate him, and he will chase him. Okay, doesn't look like anyone's driven here yet, so I've got, I've got a feeling this is the, the spot. Maybe that leopard was moving through these little river systems. It's gonna pop out. She's gonna pop out in front of us. So jean and I are checking very carefully. Now, what we look for when we're looking for a leopard like this, so obviously we're still listening trying to find out if any animal spots it. And the most important thing is that little white tip to the tail. It's just that slightly different color from the rest of the bush and it sticks out. And that's probably the best way to spot a leopard that's walking through bush like this. You just catch that white tip of the tail. Of course, it's always better if they just decide to walk in the road in front of us. It makes life a lot easier. We 
changes this road curves around and heads north when we get to that corner i'm just going to switch off for a second see if we can hear anything so i'm just going to listen again fingers crossed we hear something Starling calling in the distance. You can hear someone at camp using a hammer. It's probably Connor. Okay, so no indications of anything. Have you spotted something, Jandre? Negative. You're just looking at the pretty trees. Yes, yeah, the pretty trees. Those pretty trees Jean-Ray was showing you there without their leaves on on this distance look to be. Mm -hmm. Well one's a dead a dead knob thorn, acacia, and the other looks to be a false marula. Okay. So there's here's one of these big elephant paths that come out of this area. So I'm here trying to check to see if whatever caused those monkeys to alarm call possibly used one of these big pods. Oh, speaking about elephants, not only do they make big pods, they sometimes block our way. I'm just going to try and move this tree quickly. Now, it could be a bit heavy, it is a, a bush willow, a russet bush willow. And the funniest thing is, elephants don't really like to eat it. And it, this one's barely been fed off, it's just sort of been pushed over. Yeah! Let's try this one. Well, that'll do till the tractor can come remove it properly. We are getting a lot of that at the moment. Elephants pushing over trees on the roads. Did I hear a Franklin alarm call? Did you hear a Franklin alarm call? No. Let's continue. I've seen Tingana take before where he comes up this creek system here and he almost pops out right on the northern fire break. And male leopards are capable of doing some serious walking. Alas, it doesn't look too promising at the moment. I haven't seen any footprints. I haven't heard any alarm calls again. Hi, Tammy. Tammy is in the Big Apple, New York. And Tammy would like to know what is the difference between the low felt and the high felt? Well, the main difference, Tammy, is the vegetation. Sorry, Cindy, not Tammy. 
I had the game drive talk here at the same time. I do apologize, Cindy in New York, not Tammy in New York. Right, so Cindy, the main difference is the vegetation. You see, the low felt is mostly mixed open grassland and wooded savanna. The high felt is grassland. Uh, very few indigenous occurring trees on the high felt uh, and the true high felt. So it's 90% grassland uh, and very few trees. With the low felt, it's mostly trees and not so much grassland or grassland interspersed between the trees. Uh, that's the main difference, Cindy. Also, of course, uh, a bit of the obvious one uh, in the name, high felt, low felt. <laughs> low felt is quite low. We're only about 400 meters above sea level. Uh, Johannesburg's in the high felt environment. Remember correctly, it's about 2,000 meters. One six, there we go, Jean de knows, above sea level. Now, an interesting little fact about Johannesburg, it is one of the only major cities in the world that is not built on a major river or on a port or the ocean. So, very, very interesting. And the reason Johannesburg spouted where it is is because of gold. It wouldn't, it would, there was no reason other to, than to build that city there other than the fact that one of the richest gold seams in the world was there. So the reason a lot of old major cities sit on either rivers or on the ocean is of course trade used to run around those things. So rivers used to move uh, people and trade from the hinterland out to the ocean where it could then be traded even further. And you even look at some of the ancient cities and uh, a lot of those are built on or mo modern ancient cities so the last sort of couple of hundred years are all built on rivers or on ports uh, there's even the the M Mapingubwe ruins which is a well, I think they are just before about 2000 or so years old just before BC um, and that, those were built on the Limpopo River and even if you go up East Africa, the ancient ruins of Kilwa and Gedi in Kenya and Tanzania, respect or Gedi's in Kenya, Kilwa's in Tanzania, uh, also built on the ocean and were major, major ports a uh, thousand or so years ago. Now I'm almost at a loss of what to do. We've literally scoured this area. What to do next is the question. So what I'm going to do, the lines are still around Sydney's dam. I'm just going to ask if there's visual from the boundary and see if we can get a sight of those lines, even if it's a very long, long sighting of the lines. Let's just find out quickly because we are quite close by. Andrew, is there any visual of those in Gala from the boundary? Fingers crossed. Copy, thanks very much, Andrew. Okay, so there's a small possibility we might be able to see those lions from a distance. So we're going to take that chance and hopefully while we're sitting quietly with the lions, we might hear the alarm calls that will lead us to a leopard. Might get a silhouetted lioness on the damn wall. Fortunately, we've got the big zoom camera. Might come down for a drink, then we might get a visual of them.
temperature's dropping quite quickly now. I see Jandre has already beaten me to it. He's got his jacket on. I'm gonna follow the suit. Much better. Ooh. Okay, that's good news as well. So there's a big herd of buffalo on the way towards the dam. Maybe the lions will chase them because I hear the buffalo they caught is quite small. So fingers crossed. And we couldn't really be in a better spot in positioning ourselves overlooking that vast open area around the dam. So we're definitely going to have to wait this one out, I think. Okay, so while we try to figure out what's going on here at Sydney's, uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Here we go, we have a signal once again. And we're still trying to figure out exactly where that male lion has gone, at the same time keeping an eye out for Tingana's tracks. Everybody this afternoon is on the search for Tingana. <laughs> Tax is searching, Herbert is searching, Brent and myself are all searching, and several of the Cheetah Plains vehicles. So we are searching high and low to find you a leopard. I was just saying to Viam that this light is really beautiful, this golden light at the moment. It would be even more beautiful if we could find a leopard slinking about in it. Well, it seems as though Brent is outdoing us on the bird front. He has another one to show you. So, an incredibly long distance visual of a couple of lioness on the dam wall. Here we go. And you can definitely see they've eaten but not too full. So apparently there is a big herd of buffalo on their way down here. It'll be very interesting to see what happens. Now, far more interesting at this very moment in the sleeping lions, these guinea fowl out in front of me, chasing each other around, doing some quite acrobatic jumps. There's one, look there, you okay. Velociraptors. Very prehistoric looking birds, the guinea fowl. <laughs> and a lot more active than those lions. So, they flock during the winter months and can move quite big distances between food. And during the summer months, they pair off to breed in twos. So when you, you see a big group of guinea fowl, it's not the breeding season. And they do eat lots of different things, insects and that, but their main food is grass seeds. I can't hear that buffalo herd yet, but I have been told they were crossing the access road, which is about 500 meters from here. They're quite a lovely spot to sit and soak up the afternoon ambience with lions in the distance, guinea fowl in the foreground, and some buffalo on the way. Buffalo, bro. Still quite far away by the sounds of things. Now there's three lionesses there and apparently there is a male. But he is feeding and the carcass is unfortunately out of sight for us. Now 
Lions are opportunists, so even though they have got a kill and they might be quite full, if the opportunity comes to grab another buffalo, they most certainly will. Every now and then you just hear brrr, in the distance, a buffalo heading this way. You can see the sun is setting, and there's a golden orb settling. It's a very still afternoon, just some babblers making a little bit of noise. Quite nice to just sit quietly and enjoy. Oh, look at that! <laughs> That's a seriously high-speed guinea fowl race going on. You almost feel like you need a need a, a commentator for this race, except it's a little bit pandemonium. No one knows who's chasing it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and you can see how fast they are, incredibly quick on their feet. There we go. <laughs> oh, and back. Hilarious. Oh, and a few grass seeds to pick, and off we go again. Dun 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 dun. We almost need to put music to this. Okay, it seems like we've calmed down a bit. So, before we enjoy a moment's note, are we on the race again? <laughs> Strange looking creatures, guinea fowl. Okay, seems like pandemonium is over. So a cat in Tampa was wondering, she knows breeding herds of buffalo will try to defend against lions. Will bachelor herds do the same? Most certainly cat. Not as aggressively as the breeding herds though, but they will. So I'm just gonna, let's just enjoy a moment silence with a spectacular view behind us. And as the sun sets, it's just soaking this African gorgeousness. Well spotted. Um, there we go, there's a hooded vulture and white-backed vulture. And of course, there is a buffalo carcass there. There are the girls. Oh, look at that. Oh, nice camera work. Oh, oh, is that quite often vultures will always try to choose a dead tree to land in like the first ones we had a look at. Now because of their large wingspan it can be quite difficult to take off and land in a thorny tree like that one and that's what we just saw. So those vultures have got 
the prime spot in terms of the, their perch for the evening. No movement on the lines. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous evening. The sun's about to dip below the sun. Here's the sun, just the last glimmer of the golden orb as it sinks below the western horizon. Snoop is wondering, do a guinea fowl fly? They can, Snoop. They'll generally try outrun anything before flying as a last resort. They also do roost in trees, so they will sleep in a tree. Much safer there. And, uh, well, hopefully... For these guinea fowl's sake, leopard, actually very good guinea fowl hunters, serval, caracal, uh, those are their main sort of prey, and as, as well as birds like African hawk eagles are incredibly great at taking them um, from the air. But these guineas look quite safe and they're definitely in no threat from those lions. Hi, Lauren. Uh, Lauren Pretorius would like to know how fast a guinea fowl can run. I'm not 100% sure, Lauren. I guess probably around 40 kilometers an hour or so. And I will try double check and find out for you. Oh, there we go. Blacksmith Lapwing cruising in. We just need to move off the road. There's a car coming. We just going to make some space for it. Hi, Rachel. Rachel would like to know, when do the migratory birds start to return? Well, Rachel, probably November at the earliest. So they'll be gone till then. Now, the moment we've been waiting for is happening. That buffalo herd is about to arrive at the dam. Move back a little bit. There's a champion in the area about to arrive as well. They've caught one. Ah. Oh, really? Awesome. So maybe a third attempt now. Kankies, okay. Cool. Enjoy, guys. So, they're the lions. They're the buffalo right in front of us. There they are. So, Mike just told me there that. They've tried to hunt these buffalo, or buffalo coming down to drink three times today already, or two, twice. They caught one, failed at another. So maybe we'll get to see round three. I know Jandre would be ecstatic with that. Uh, getting to form a lion and buffalo hunt. So Rachel, just in case you didn't hear, uh, I said the first migratory birds should only be back around November. So guys, just got to be on the game drive radio quickly. Andrew, they're busy crossing Buffalo cut line at the moment, heading down that sort of small shkova with the trees towards the dam. Oh, look, 
there's a little one. So look at that, isn't that just the sweetest? Now, that's a couple of days old. Buffalo calves have a very unique feeding pattern. Because buffalo herds move constantly, they're one of the few animals that is able to feed while on the move. So they'll position themselves between mom's back legs, just like that, and they will drink while mom is walk and the rest of the herd are moving. Now, the other thing is, the unfortunate thing if you're a baby buffalo and you're drinking on the move, you get the odd buffalo pat on top of your head. So those buffalo are going to pop out probably around there. The lions are over there. It's not the best position. Now they might wait for the buffalo to get closer to the dam wall or move around. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens. And I don't think anything's going to happen just yet. Here we go, up come the buffalo. Still no reaction from the lions. No, not even a head up from the lions yet. They have not spotted the buffalo. Oh, one lioness has moved slightly, popped herself under the gory bush. So, someone was wondering whether the buffalo react or how Ellen in Arkansas, how they react. Do they, when the buff, uh, how do they know the lions are close by? Do they smell them? Do they see them? Well, generally, if they smell them, they become a bit nervous, but they only really react when they see them. And they definitely haven't spotted them yet. Now, if I were the lions, I'd hope the buffalo sort of Oh, there we go. Move around. I was trying to find my hand on the screen. <laughs> move around like that. And if they stay still, there's a good chance that that herd might move right. Sorry, Andrew, go again. Wow, there's another herd of buffalo coming from the other side. It's all happening here. So there's another herd of buffalo coming from behind the dam wall. What you got there in the tree? Hardy Dar Ibis, well spotted, John Depp. I can still hear buffalo coming from quite a way away, so it could be quite a large herd. And, John Depp, if we come out and to the left, and we go a bit more left, a little bit more left, and a little bit more left, zoom there. That dust is from another buffalo herd coming in. A little bit to the left. There we go. Oh, well spotted. There we go. So, bu buffalo coming in from two directions. It looks like there's a little movement on the line. We've suddenly noticed that they are being engulfed by potential dindins. One of the ways we find buffalo, not so much here in the Sabi Sands, but definitely in northern Botswana, 
is by that cloud of dust they create, those big herds. And we get massive herds, oh, well over a thousand. And see what I was saying? If I was the lion, I'd just keep still and wait for the buffalo to be silly enough to walk towards me. So Terry's wondering, will the adults protect the wobbly little one? Uh, they will try, but there will be a point when they'll give up. It just depends. Each scenario is different. You can still hear more buffalo coming from Juma towards Sydney's. And of course, there's that looks like a much bigger herd coming from the north. And that's just judging on the amount of dust they're creating. Look at that. That's spectacular. And no one's noticed the lions yet. I mean, they could literally almost walk under the lions. Jandre, are you getting a little bit excited? Me too. Now, if I was a lion, I'd just sit at Sydney's. Good spot to be if you're a kitty cat. Now, look at that female. Oh, they're not sure. Look at her head. Look how she's just suddenly dipped her head. Now, now, now things have changed. I'm watching a lot more carefully. Oh, look at them spilling over the, the dam. John, just off to the left. Look at that. This is a proper herd of buffalo coming in. And then literally, like water over the dam wall, just spilling in. I think we're going to move a little bit forward, because if they're going to go, they're going to go for that herd, I think, Jean-André. So I just want to get us on the right side of the bush. So if they do run this side, we not miss any action. OK, so I just see there's a bush here. I just want to make sure. We've got a nice wide view like this, so we get everything if in case something happens. Get Chandra on a nice even, even piece of road. There we go. How's that for you, Chandra? There we go. Okay, now let's see what drama unfolds here in the African bush. Look at that. This is a massive herd coming from the Manuleti. So, Canada Keith is asking, do buffaloes plan a mass march to the water and how do they communicate? Well, they communicate mostly through bellows. And uh, they drink twice a day, and they do live in herds like cattle. So I don't think there's too much communication. It's early morning thirst and late evening thirst. They've been out all day grazing. And if they can, buffalo like to drink twice a day. They are very, very dependent on water. Oh, it's just more and more coming across from the Manuleti. Look at that! Like a sea of buffalo. And the more and more they clog up that little corner, the further and further the, towards the lions they're going to push. And the other herd are still coming across the road in front of us. See, there we go, they're still coming through. There's just, I mean, there could probably 400 odd buffalo around here at the moment.
And there's a chance because the Lions are full, they're not going to do much. But we're definitely in the prime spot right now to see if anything does happen. Okay, one, one lioness up. Buffalo still haven't spotted her. Oh, there we go. Little stretchy stretch. Is it time to catch a buffalo? Well, the buffalo still haven't spotted the lion. And they're still pouring in over from the Manuretti. There's a bit of bull chasing another bull. light on those buffalo. So I hope you guys are getting some good screenshots. I'm going to snap one or two quickly. Oh, a bit slow. So if you're snapping screenshots, don't forget to share them with us. And you can do that on Facebook, on the Safari Live Facebook page. Or you can put it on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. from the lines yet. If the buffalo keeps streaming over, eventually they're going to almost end up underneath the lions to drink. Have they been spotted? No, I thought one bull might have spotted them for a second. I can't believe it. The other herd is still streaming. So I think by the time these two herds have joined, there's going to be over 500 buffalo here. I think they're still going, just a constant stream in front of us. definitely the biggest group of buffalo I've seen since I've been at Safari Live and I mean we can't even see a whole bunch of them that are still coming across. So Ellen's wondering would the lions ever give up and move away because they're just so many buffalo. Uh, the buffalo might chase them away. That, that can happen, Ellen. Uh, but lions, when they hunt buffalo, they tend to, it tends to go both ways. They chase and then they also get chased. And sometimes it can take them the whole night of harassing a herd to try to find a weak individual or a baby to grab. Have we lost the lioness? Or are there still all three there? No, I think we've... One's... Hang on a second. Is that a cub? Yeah, all three. all three. I only thought there was a cub there for a second. You can see that big belly. I really need to eat. So the buffalo will have to make it quite easy for them to actually do anything. So it's sort of meander underneath their schnozzers. Oh, 
There we go. One's, one's off on the stalk. There we go. Suddenly, stuff is happening. Look how they're flattening themselves to the ground. I think there's a buffalo walking along the dam wall. I can't really see. There could be some others coming up closer, but we're going to stick on the lines. There we go. See, there's those buffalo in front, but there's still more to the left. Oh, if they do chase them, this could be absolute chaos. <laughs> Bless you, Jean Pierre. See, all of a sudden, body language changed. I wonder what they saw. Maybe there was an injured one, or maybe a baby came a little bit closer. But all of a sudden, there's a little bit more intent in these lines. Oh, front one moving a little bit again. Who's ready for a stampede? There's a buffalo bull fight going on, or chase at least. Now, see those buffalo there? If they keep walking down the damn wall, they're going to literally step on the lions. Ah, uh, look, has that little calf got a sore leg? No. Got a bit more movement on the lions. Jacob, Joyce and Nancy would like to know, would the herds ever mix? Most definitely. Uh, buffalo herds mix and depart and break up and get back together constantly. So most definitely they would mix. Okay. We've got a little bit more movement there. So she's positioned herself behind a bush. The other lioness is on the other side of the wall. Now... Where's the closest buffalo? The ones on this side of the water are quite safe. It's the others that are in trouble. Amazing, the buffalo have not spotted, her, spotted them yet. Remember, there could be a buffalo coming over from the other side that we can't see that's much closer. So we've lost visual of one lioness. She might have ducked behind the wall. And depending on where she chases them from, they could run straight into the other two females. Exciting. Come on and call my ladies. If they are, then call my ladies. Come on, lions. Go team feline.
And a big altercation going on between Buffalo. Someone was getting bullied, was complaining profusely about it. Still visual, only two. Where's the third? <coughs> well, the second female's going behind that bush. Head popping out there, Jean. Eh? No, no. On the left of that bush that she went behind. Mm, difficult to see. Sorry about the grain, guys. The light is getting difficult, and those lines are incredibly far away. And Jean is trying to do his best so we can see everything. So it's actually probably about five or six shades darker than what you're seeing on your your screens at the moment because jean Ray is doing some magic with his camera work to bring us that little bit more light. Massive herd of buffalo now. Look at that. The dust that they've created. So Doodles is wondering, would that elevated position on the damn wall hinder their hunting? Well, not really, Doodles. Oh, there we go. The third and final lioness is up. Now, basically what they would do in that initial charge, unless they targeted a specific buffalo, they're just going to charge to create pandemonium, basically what they're doing. And they're going to create as much chaos as possible and often that first initial charge onto the the buffalo doesn't yield yield anything but the second or third or even fourth or fifth might so they keep putting the pressure on those buffalo till they can grab a young one or an injured one but we don't want to miss because i can't see what's going on with my eyes so we're gonna let the camera do the work for us and we now have no lionesses so I think the safest thing to do is stay on the, the largest congregation of buffalo to the left and hope they chase them towards us. I haven't been in the buffalo stampede for a while. And the head is moving away, finished drinking. So Charlie's wondering how long can a lion sustain a full speed charge before it tires? Well, Charlie uh, can probably do it for no more than about 60 or 70 meters. They, they're sort of ambush predators. They're built for high explosive speed over, quick dis over, over a short distance, and then they will slow down. Uh, otherwise, they get really bad lactic acid buildup. I really want to see what's going on. Come on, lions. Chase it. You don't even have to catch it. Just please chase the buffalo for us. I just wanted to see that massive herd in panic. I 
Unfortunately, those buffalo are <laughs> going away from the dam. So the lions might try to grab them on the other side of the dam wall where we can't see anything. Beautiful light filtering through the dust created by the buffalo. Let's wait a little bit longer to see what happens, but I think unfortunately any action that's going to happen is going to happen behind the dam wall. But come on, prove me wrong, lions. Almost like they teased us, teased us, teased us, teased us, and then didn't deliver the bang. So, Deb, how are you doing, Deb Fifner? Deb would like to know are there any other animals apart from lions that will kill again, even if they've got a kill? All the predators out here, they're opportunists and they don't mind eating rotting meat. So they'll finish the one kill and then start on the next. So most predators, anything from a leopard, a cheetah, a hyena, wild dog, will always kill if they get the opportunity to. waiting for is just basically an explosion and when a buffalo herd runs from lions it sounds like a, like like a roar like a tidal wave coming in and we can hear not so much a tidal wave but a bush being beaten off to our left which is by a <coughs> buffalo bull scratching his head Betsy said she's seen a lion hunt where the herd... Oh, hyena! Gonna come out. Still too dark with this? He's gonna come out. Where's he gone? There he is. Spotlight coming. One second. There we go. There's a hyena. There's a spotted hyena. He's obviously might be able to smell the kill. I'm sure that hyena can probably smell the carcass. I'm just listening to the game drive radio quickly to see how it's going on. Oh dear. They've followed the buffalo into the manuletti. 
Oh dear. Well, that is what it is. And we are live in the African bush, so we have no control over what they're going to do. And we don't do any setups out here. But uh, Betsy was wondering about buffalo herds. She said they've seen, she's seen buffalo herds help a buffalo that's been attacked by lions. And she's also seen them not help. Why don't they help every time? So they'll only really help if they feel there's a good chance that they're going to be able to chase off the lions and not put themselves in danger. And each scenario is different. So it all depends where it is, what time of the day, what time of the year even. So at this time of the year, when times are tough, you know, it was a car starting, I got really excited. But anyway, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, I think those lions are following the other buffalo into the Manuretti. So while we do that, uh, let's go see Jamie. Red's been having an extraordinary afternoon. Me and my, myself have been less fortunate, but our luck has turned. And we've got a lovely little bush baby He's hiding behind the leaves. If you look carefully, you'll see him moving about there every now and again. And hopefully, we sit here nice and still and we keep quiet for a little bit. At least keep our voices down. There's a chance that he or she might decide to pop his head out. You can see it moving. It's still there. It just jumped across the path in front of us. It's amazing watching a little bush baby jump. Bush babies have been recorded to jump sort of horizontal distances of eight meters, which is 24 feet. And there he, oh, there he goes. Uh, sorry, there he is. I'm going to go forward a bit because I don't think that VM can see him from this angle. Amazing little primate. The smallest primate in the Sabi Sands. Yeah, he's making life a bit tricky there. Oh, and I think he's just bounced away. Oh, no. He's still all right at the back there. Unfortunately, I think this is going to be the end of our sighting unless it decides to come back through and across. Uh, not the best view, but one of the cutest animals that you could see out here. A little, it was a lesser bush baby, also known as a lesser galago. Now, there are some places in the African bush, less so here, but in places with Miombo woodland up further to the north, where they have been recorded in densities of up to 500 individual bush baby per square kilometer. And that came through from a research paper into the sort of the different densities of bush babies throughout. Now, the lesser bush baby, or the lesser galago, the one that we were looking at there is the most widely spread of all of the different bush babies and lorises. Now they all fall, fall under this particular heading or particular family group, the lorises and the bush babies. The lesser bush baby is the most widely spread of those animals. Now here's an interesting thing about bush babies. Uh, evolutionary theorists believe that the bush baby is one of the most primitive types of monkeys, so they probably are the closest to the primate ancestor, what the original primate ancestor would have looked like. Well, they feed on insects and tree gum, but this is where the, the sort of the interesting aspect of their evolutionary history comes in. Their hands, they've got hands and they've got thumbs, just like all primates, but they cannot move their fingers independently. What that means is that they've got a very basic grasp. They can open and close their hands, but they can't actually independently move their fingers. And this is one of the reasons or one of the things that led the scientists to believe that they are or a, primitive, a primitive design. The earliest of the prosimians a little grasping hand. And that's how theorists actually believe that the primate hand developed with that initial need to grab fast moving things. Something like an insect, for example, which bush babies are exceptionally good at. And 
it helps that they are phenomenally cute to look at, very fluffy looking. And if you ever visit South Africa and you stay in some of the lodges, there's always a chance that you'll encounter a habituated bush baby that has learned to hop about whilst guests are having dinner and occasionally, because of all of the sugars, try and steal their alcoholic drinks, particularly whiskey. Apparently bush babies are exceptionally fond of whiskey. I'm trying to see if I can't find another one for you. I know that the other day Brent tried to show all of you the, the family of bush babies that was cuddled up at Mike and Candace's house just next door to our camp. And that's basically how they will sleep. So they're very social creatures during the day and they'll cuddle up together and spend the day sleeping together, protect safety in numbers basically. Very often with a male and then several females. They don't have to be related but they often are in sort of little family groups. And the male, kind of like a male lion or a group of male lions, the male bush baby has several little groups of females that he will move between and spend time with. They're not hugely territorial, but they do have their little home ranges and they do scent mark quite famously by what's known as urine wetting. So they, they basically, they urinate on their hands and then place it on their feet as well so that it carries their scent. So if you do find yourself um, ex experiencing a bush baby up close, a tame bush baby, just remember where its hands and feet have been. It'll probably, if it jumps on you, it will mark you with <laughs> its, its distinctive scent. Let's put it that way. Oh, we have searched high and low for Tingana. I've driven almost every road that I possibly can on Juma to search for him. And I just have this funny feeling he's going to pop out at the pan or call right next, right next to camp the minute we finish our sunset safari. I just have that funny feeling that that's his plan for his evening. I think that he's been found himself a nice, comfortable spot to sleep spend the day under a bush in the shade sleeping off a foolish belly I don't know whether the kill that he had on Torchwood was a large kill and was stolen or if it was just a small snack like a Daco or Steenbock or maybe a baby warthog that he finished in one sitting but either way I suspect that he is sleeping off a relatively full belly Welcome to Chitra, who's watching in India and absolutely loving being out on safari with us. Now, Chitra, you're wondering if we have an in-house herp... Pathologist. That was interesting. How do you suppose that happened, Liam? Did you see what happened? Um, I, I can't quite work out how that hit me in the nose. <laughs> it kind of flicked from the aerial and may, bopped me right in the center of my nose. Not having very good luck recently with sticks and other vegetation. <laughs> Sorry Chitra, we'll get back to you in a moment. That was quite a surprise. Nothing like an unexpected stick suddenly joining you in the vehicle. So Chitra, on the subject of a herpetologist, no, we don't have a herpetologist to show you the snakes and reptiles. That being said, all of us share a fascination with these incredible creatures. Uh, you're joining us sort of at the wrong time to see snakes and other reptiles, just because a lot of them are going not into hibernation, 
but into a type of slowed metabolism state that is known as estivation as a result of the dryness. But you could well still see snakes, and we do. We've had, in the last few months since I started working here, we have two incredible black mamba sightings. We've had a few cobra sightings, um, some very memorable worm slums on bushwalk, and then, of course, the other reptiles, such as the various types of lizards, legavans, or rock monitor lizards, anything like that. So we do all have a fascination when it comes to snakes and other reptiles. I partic I'm particularly fond of tortoises. I'm a Chelonian fan. I find tortoises fascinating. So if you do keep watching, and I'm sure that you, I have no doubt that you will, you are guaranteed a good reptile sighting at some point that we'll be able to tell you, hopefully tell you a little bit about. And ah, but that we could have an expert in every field chat about the geology and the, the stars and the plants and the vegetation. But as it is, we spend as much of our time as we possibly can, particularly in between drives, learning and taking in as much information as possible. We'll keep you up to date on reptile sightings. And I'm sure the, some of the regular viewers out there have many reptile sightings that they have enjoyed and probably some that stand out. I feel as though my black mamba sighting was quite incredible. The first one we had, I came around the corner and a black mamba reared up at the car and then body slammed into the ground, which is one of their ways of intimidating before biting. And they've got a terrible reputation as being in a, a very aggressive snake, which isn't entirely fair. They certainly have got, they are of course the most dangerous snake to be bitten by. Their venom acts very, very quickly. There's a goshawk that just flew out of that tree, I think. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't an owl. As you know, we don't spotlight the daytime animals and that includes the daytime birds, the diurnal birds. We've also had, and I think we've actually published a few behind the scenes videos. If you have a look at our Facebook page, you'll be able to see some of the, the Safari Live Facebook page. You might be able to see some of the behind the scenes videos where we've gone catching snakes and removing them from camp. Uh, it hasn't happened recently, so you might have to go back in time a little bit, but we've definitely had moments where we've had to either remove or attempt to remove the cobra from the kitchen. I've woken up with a variegated bush snake climbing into bed with me before. We had a very rare sighting of a snake called a shield cobra. And of course, the best way to view reptiles, particularly lizards and geckos and the like, is during the bushwalk. It gives us the opportunity to get right up close to the littler things that we sometimes miss when we're driving along in the vehicle. has been relatively, let's call it peaceful, let's, let's keep it at that, but apparently the lovely ladies at Final Control have prepared, since this did happen so quickly, they have prepared a slow motion clip of my biggest surprise of the day. So here we go, have a look at this. <laughs> I hope that <laughs> you all found that very entertaining. <laughs> the FC girls <laughs> definitely doing me a favour there. 
<laughs> All right. Well, that, I think, on that note, draws us to the again tomorrow morning to find you a leopard. Now, thank you, Vian, for all of your fantastic camera work, as always, as well as to Rebecca and Lou in final control. Thank you for your slow motion clip. And most importantly, thank you to all of you across the world. I'm going to send you back across to Brent for the last few moments of the sunset safari, and I will see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay, we're rushing. We're going to try and get a close-up view of a lion before the end of drive. It's about to come towards the Juma Dam Cam, so if we don't get there in time, keep an eye on the Dam Cam, because there's a lioness coming. One of the Inkahumas who's been mating, probably trying to find the rest of the pride. Apparently, she's calling. And I'm nearly there. little bush back. We're in a rush. Oh, I hope we get there. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure she's going to arrive at the Juma Dam Cam for a drink. All right, can you see any lights down here, Jandre? I don't know if we're going to make it! Hopefully we will! We've got three minutes! Three minutes! We can do it! Oh. Three minutes, somewhere here. Hopefully I don't lose Jandre. Far. Hold on, bouncy bounce. Sorry, I'm not looking back. I'm just trying to concentrate on not bouncing the cameraman off the vehicle while we rush to try and get uh, a view of the Nkuma Lioness before the last few seconds of drive. But don't forget, we do it all again tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari. Uh, very exciting. There'll also be a fireside chat tomorrow and the 1st of June the times are going to be changing yes I think we're gonna make it I see the spotlights I don't see the lioness There she is. She's about to pop through there. There she is. It looks like that young female. So she's definitely looking for the rest of the pride. And she's heading off into the thickets and the drainage system. Ah, well, we made it with a minute to spare. Put my reverse light on to get out of the way. Okay. So I, we're not definitely not going to try go down into there. That's into one of those big creek systems, really thick, and uh, especially at night we can't really see where we're going. So, but at least we got a little glimpse of her, and hopefully we'll be able to find them on the sunrise safari, and. Hopefully Tingana is still about and we are going to have hopefully find a leopard. But anyway, a nice little bit of fun Ferrari safari at the end of the drive there to try and get you that little glimpse of the Inkahuma lioness returning to the pride. Now, I still have to wonder, is that really Junior there or could it be another young male? Maybe from the Talamati pride, but we're going to have to wonder about that till tomorrow and we'll see you in a few short hours. Toodaloo!